Hey, this is Sharif Yunus here with another episode of The Golden Hour, joined by Dr. Kevin Majors. Kevin, good to be here with you again. Hey, Sharif, great to be here. Well, Kevin, I thought it would be great today to talk about uh, kind of the concept of experience. And we talk about, in, in terms of flow, flow somehow sometimes is defined uh, as the state of optimal experience. And then also related to that is this idea of self-transcendence, which we talked, we did an episode a while ago on Maslow, and that's kind of the peak of the Maslow hierarchy of, of needs is the need to transcend oneself. Um, and then there's there's this idea that, well, you combine those two things, experience and transcendence, and you get something like awe or wonder. Um, so I wanted to talk about the role of awe in life in general or in psychology as you see it, and then how it relates to our approach in optimal work. What do you think about that? Sure, it's a great question because you know up until 15 years ago, there is practically nothing written about awe. You know, it uh, well, Edmund Burke wrote about it actually a long time ago, but it seems like his uh, goal was to um, just teach people that you can find awe in anything. But in psychology, we haven't really had a lot of um, studying of it until the last 15 years. And then now there are more and more books that have come out. Probably the best of the recent ones is Awestruck by Jonah Paquette. Um, just a nice overview of, of awe in, you know, in a lot of different areas of life. Uh, but anyway, I think that it's a, an interesting emotion to go more deeply into that people seldom talk about. So, okay, that's, that's kind of the first question. Is awe an emotion uh, or, or what is awe? Yeah. In terms of like, you know, when you think of what an emotion is, essentially it's some kind of uh, passive response on the part of the person uh, to something that they're perceiving right now. So that they're, they're re it's, a, it's a reaction to some perception. And probably anything that is just like that, that's a reaction that stays within you, is going to be something like an emotion. But awe is very interesting because most emotions would tend to make us a little more uh, self-concerned or self-focused. You know, if you were, even if you were just like feeling, you know, extremely happy, you know, it's you're, you can sometimes just be focused on how happy you feel. So it's like uh, it doesn't necessarily make you tune into the world around you. Awe is pretty uh, unique in that it's a powerful emotion that tunes us like into the world around us. And interestingly, it shows that it is much more likely that we think then of others after these awe experiences. So there's something about, which fits with Maslow's idea of self-transcendence being the height. Because when you're hitting that, then you are more forgetting self, focusing on others. But there's plenty of research that that's exactly what awe does. Awe, the, after an experience of awe, you tend to feel um, like you want to somehow serve others and and can and give yourself to them. Yeah, and one of the studies that's recorded in by Jonah Paquette uh, is that they took two groups and they put one to basically look at this array of beautiful trees that would it was meant to inspire awe. That was one group. And then the control group just looked at kind of a boring science building. And then they had it staged so that an actor would walk by and drop something in front of them while they were looking at this thing. And the group that was looking at the beautiful trees that inspired awe was more likely to then help the person pick pick up whatever they had dropped. So the idea was awe leads to altruism. Yeah, that was the summary of that study, the eucalyptus trees. So uh, yeah, and and uh, I think that it's counterintuitive that when you're in the state of rapt attention of awe, that you are much quicker to actually come to the, to, to the help of others. But it's been, that's been shown again and again, you know, that awe experiences really do correlate with people being more generous and more kind and more altruistic in general. Yeah. Can you talk about um, like to what extent these are as a deliberate thing or is it, it seems like sometimes it's something that you passively experience. You can certainly 
kind of stop going along with it. I think uh, it's described that uh, uh, seeing a beautiful sunset, you can kind of then just, just, okay, you just look away and start distracting yourself with your phone. Um, So it's, it's, you can definitely pull yourself out of it, but then you can't really choose to experience awe. It's something that just strikes you from outside almost, but then it's connected with almost a heightened sense of deliberation late uh, after the fact. So I don't know. Yeah, it's a great question. It seems like I bet that many f- parents have brought their children to the most awe-inspiring sites and the kids would like just want to be on their phones <laughs> or like not, or be fighting with each other. You know, and, and, and so probably parents have learned that you can't force awe on people. <laughs> so it does require some minimal amount of correspondence. So, I, But I, I think that is openness, that we have to be open to the experience we have to be looking for it to some extent, but you can't do it like on your own. You can't force it either. You know, and that's the beautiful thing of it. It's an interplay between us and something that is like vastly beyond us. And I should mention that those are one element of awe is that in somehow there needs to be this element of vastness. And and that could be something that is perceptual, like you know, the Grand Canyon or a sunset, you know, or something. You know, it could be like a, I don't know, any anything that has a sense of like, whoa, this is something much deeper. And also, it could be conceptual. That sometimes an idea can strike people, you know, as, as being that is an extremely profound idea, and they get a sense of awe from from hearing it. So you combine that sense of vastness. With the sense of that this is, this really is makes me transcend myself, yeah. You know, and now I have to change. That in some way this is like bigger than what I thought it would be before, yeah. You know, and so, so I say vastness and transcendence are the two main marks of awe experiences, but at the same time that shouldn't make us think that it has to be something extraordinary. That that you can discover, like we I think I talked in the past about Whitaker Chambers. You know, and he was struck with awe at his newborn daughter's ear. You know, and that like what that did, that like opened him up to a whole new world. You know, and I think that that, that said it could be something very ordinary, but you see how extraordinary the ordinary can be. And so it's this new discovery of the extraordinary there. So it seems like there might be some interplay here between awe and kind of sincerity, I want to say, because... Like this, this thing that you mentioned at the end, that it awe uh, strikes you and then it changes you, so, and there has to be openness, and that seems very connected to this idea of sincerity. So, yeah, to what extent is it is it necessary, or is it the case that awe uh, then changes you, and so it's it's like you see something that you've never seen before, and so that then there's a response on your part to that sense of awe. Uh, that okay, I have to do things differently. Is that does that always go along with it, or is it is it a necessary part of it? Yeah, it's good. I think that in that sense that yes, yeah, sincerity is all about am I am I am I truly seeking the greatest good at this moment? And and so it gets to the question: you know, what am I seeking? And if we're just seeking our own satisfaction or our own you know comfort, I think that we tend to be more closed in on ourselves versus when we're really looking for, you know, that, that what is the greatest good here? And then we open up. Now, in the end, I think awe is actually very satisfying, uh, but it's not that we were seeking ourselves or seeking our own satisfaction. We were just opening up to what is. And so in that sense, yeah, there, there it does require a certain kind of sincerity on the person really looking for the best thing, you know, and, and maybe looking to get out of themselves. So they're looking, I think, to actually transcend themselves in some way. And so if like if you were gonna go on a hike, you know, and you know, the main goal was just to talk to the person you're hiking with about a business deal, you know, you might not be thinking at all about the beauty of the surroundings. And so you might not be open to awe at all. That's because that just wasn't what you were seeking. But you could go on a hike with a deliberate idea of seeking out the experience of beauty and and the grandeur that's outside yourself, really taking in nature. And you could actually do that in your own neighborhood. 
you can, you know, you can have that sense, you know, even in the most ordinary places of just going on these walks where you are taking in the beauty of everything, you know, and I think that, you know, with that, you know, you can have these experiences of awe, uh, that, that happen because you set the stage for them. I mean, that's the way I say it. Sincerity sets the stage to be able to receive awe. Yeah, that's, that's a great way to put it now. Okay. I, kind of maybe slightly bigger picture, picture question is awe good. Uh, so that maybe co- comes off a little odd. So let me just explain myself a little bit. Um, like in the example that you gave, if you're on a hike with a business partner and you're just talking about work, uh, you know, a friend and you're just talking about their business. Well, uh, we would say, okay, what is, what are, what are the ideals that you can live in this situation? Um, and it seems like, okay, you can be helpful. You can, you're being available to this person. So it seems like, you know, and the bond is the most important thing relating to the person. Um, but then with awe, it's just like some experience that you get to have. Uh, so is that a good thing? Um, should we be seeking just experiences? Um, or it seems like a lot of what we, our approach is, okay, ideals and then engaging the challenge. So we should be much more concerned with how, what challenge are we engaging? How are we you know, acting in the best possible way as opposed to what am I experiencing right now? So that the focus on awe could put your focus too much on what am I experiencing? Like, sorry, just to make one more point. We, we also talk about passive challenge versus active challenges. So we want to have people have the sense that, okay, challenges aren't coming from without at me, but I'm actively challenging myself. So it seems almost like an experience of awe is like the flip side of, or like the, the kind of mirror image of a passive challenge. So it's just something that we're experiencing passively that's now it's good instead of a, a passive challenge, which is something that we don't like. Um, but we, we don't want people th- thinking in that way, right? Of, of a challenge of passively experiencing things. Yeah. And I think that when it comes to, it's a, of course, that's a very challenging question. Uh, I'm in awe of how challenging it is. <laughs> so the, but I would say that when it comes to building the bond, you know, there's two movements. One is the sense that you build the bond by sincerely intending the good of the other, you know, and, and that's the, you know, to be, uh, you know, to do good, to, you know, to be beneficent in some way. The other is that you build the bond by more deeply appreciating the other. So, and that, so there's two types of love. There's the love of benevolence and the love of complacency. This is the classical teaching on love and complacency actually here is, is, the height of that is awe. So it means that you are so taken with the one that you have the bond with, you know, that through the bond, actually, you're, you actually, you see into their beauty more deeply. And because the very fact you have a bond with them, you know, you are more in awe with them, you know, and that's what leads people to praise each other, you know, but, but praise is the reaction of awe. So awe sets the stage for all of these things where I mean, what does it mean to really you know, be lost praising someone? You know, and well, I think it means that you've had awe now for them. You know, and so there is a sense of awe, which is just the height of what in the old days was called complacency, which means that you're just taking joy in it and viewing it is viewed with pleasure, complacere. So it's like you're just viewing it with pleasure. So that's not the whole of love. <clears throat> it's not the whole of the bond, but it's a really important part of it. Yeah, and so I think there is something about it that is, um, you know, I think that like if people don't understand awe, they would never understand praise, you know, and then they would never fully understand appreciation, you know, what it means to genuinely appreciate someone. Yeah, if you really want to build a bond deeper, well, I think awe of the person you're bonded with is the way to do that, because uh, there's always something that you can find that's awe-inspiring, you know, about them. And of course, with some people, it's endlessly awe-inspiring. So if the, uh, the other thing is, you know, awe is not itself the challenge. It's really the response to the good in another or the good in some situation. 
So it doesn't necessarily have the aspect of being difficult or, or challenging. But that still, it's like a whole other way that these things bring out the best in us, not because they're a challenge. Or if they are, it's only because the challenge is to forget about ourselves so that we can attend fully to this other. And in that sense, I would say, after sincerity, the other great kind of ideal that awe deepens is humility. You know, that we forget about ourselves in the presence of what we are in awe of. You know, and that can, at its very height, be really another person, not just um, a beautiful canyon or, or, a, or a sunset, as wonderful as those are. Uh, I'm not sure those bring out the highest ideals in us, you know, but they dispose us still for greater things. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. And then it seems like uh, when you were talking earlier that you can take awe, uh, you were mentioning, it doesn't have to be the, the Grand Canyon. It can be just a walk around your neighborhood that you can take awe uh, in a, you know, a tree right outside your house because um, it's amazing. Uh, and so you can have awe uh, for, in a sense, smaller and smaller things. And then in the same way, you can kind of, uh, you can start to appreciate people for smaller and smaller things. I think one of the examples in this book is you can take awe uh, by reading about the heroic actions that someone has taken. Like, I don't, uh, wow, they went to the moon or something. Um, but you can also have this sense of appreciation going down into smaller and smaller details that you might appreciate about someone, just some small, um, generous act that a person performed. Um, so it's kind of the same sense of bringing your highest ideals into the smallest actions uh, and mm -hmm. having awe at, at kind of smaller, small. Do you see that as a as a yeah. important thing to pursue? Yeah, one thing I love that uh, that Jonah mentions in the book is uh, the idea of taking a walk with a magnifying glass mm -hmm. as a way of practicing awe. So because you because you're, you're you're used to passing by things and not really seeing how rich they are and how how intricate you know, and and the kind of patterns that exist in them. And so the, this idea of like. It's just a nice image, you know, of someone look, looking for awe in smaller, yeah, in smaller places. Uh, but yeah, so there is this thing though too of in other people learning how to really see the ideals that they are living. You know, and so any act of kindness can leave us in awe. Any act of love, of selfless attention, of devotion, of loyalty, whatever the quality is, you know, these things actually do give us a sense of awe. Uh, and I think that's the natural reaction. You know, even before particular skill or intelligence, there can be a sense of awe. And, and I think that's a wonderful disposition to be, a, you know, again, it's about how do you grow in appreciating others? You have to be open to it, so which means you're sincerely looking for it, but then you're also forgetting about yourself. On this thing of humility, one of the really beautiful things in the awe literature is that when people are having these profound awe experiences, like take the most profound, you know, the prototypical example are the, when people are like an astronaut looking down at earth. So they say that it is incredibly awe-inspiring, you know, to see the beauty of planet earth that is breathtaking. So, and they say that, that seeing an image of it, like the blue marble uh, image, the famous image, uh, um, perhaps the most popular picture of all time is called the blue marble, you know, but to be looking at that, it was astoundingly beautiful to people. And they got, they had such a powerful sense of awe that they described feeling incredibly small. So you shrink yet you don't feel like it's not your self-esteem that shrinks. It's not your estimation of yourself, but true awe experiences, they, they shrink your captivation with yourself so that you just become a very small part of your of your attention. Even if you wished otherwise practically, in the, when you're in the grips of that full awe, you would be really, you'd see, oh yeah, what am I compared to this, what I'm beholding right now? So that's a wonderful thing that it actually directly helps people to be humble, you know, to not overestimate themselves. In fact, to leave the question of esteem aside, and it's more about attention and attending. Am I fixated on myself or am I allowing myself to be captivated? That's great. So 
awe connects in a deep way to sincerity, humility. And then we already talked actually first about generosity. So that's a nice, nice connection. Um, yeah, those are the three virtues by which we transcend ourselves. So, and they're part of what we call magnanimity. So a greatness of soul. It's interesting that even though when it, with awe, we're beholding the greatness of something else, you know, something that outside of us that is vast and transcendental. But at, at the same time, it gives us greatness of soul. You know, and if people are incapable of awe, it's, it's a sad thing. And they become pusillanimous, small souls, you know, as a result of, of being incapable of awe. But if sometimes I think if you were to ask people, you know, when was the last time you really felt awe? It could be an eye opener. Many people go through life, you know, it's like, um, I don't know, it's like, uh, like their whole existence is, you know, making widgets and living in little boxes or something. It's like, there's just no sense here to, uh, to quote to, uh, tropes from the 1960s, but, uh, but there's, you know, but I, but there is a sense that leaves you small souled, and we need awe experiences to more deeply open up our soul. Yeah, that was going to be my next question: How do we foster this sense of awe, or how do we increase our awe experiences? It seems to me that uh, it's hard to experience awe if you're kind of, say, just working at a computer all day that can i mean you gave this example that looking at a picture of the blue marble can in a way and can can inspire awe um but but it does seem like awe needs to be an encounter with reality and by def if you're sitting in front of a computer by definition you're not really encountering reality you're encountering representations of reality uh so it seems like the digital age like doesn't really foster awe. I wonder. It's it might foster certain types of awe, but maybe they're not the deepest types. So in this sense, you know, the the two ways of practicing awe are kind of like um, meditation or contemplation. So meditation is reflecting on the things that are remarkable. You know, and and so you know how complex the um like you know that the, the fact that there are more stars in the sky than there are sand grains of sand on earth so just like take one fact like that okay yeah so you can meditate on these things you know that uh are truly strike like they're they, they or how old things are you know, or how connected we all are, or there's different th facts and things that, okay, that's just like meditating on these natural truths. But even the natural truths, like like I just mentioned, so if you meditate on them, you can learn to take on them. So and so, it takes like a mind that's open to something greater. So, but at the same time, to actually contemplate the beauty of a tree or of, uh, of, of, of a forest or something of that's vastly, you know, perceptual vastness, well, that, that kind of contemplation produces it also and perhaps in a deeper way. You know, and you could think about the great qualities someone has. That's like kind of meditating on it. And that's a wonderful thing. But contemplating it is where you actually somehow are tasting or touching it. Like you, you are experiencing it right now. The, 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 the sense of like how, and that contact with uh, you know, another person's love or kindness or presence in your life, you know, and to feel it, well, all, all of that then can produce a sense of awe as well. Yeah, that's interesting. So does that relate, it, we earlier we drew this distinction between perceptual and conceptual awe or awe at perceptual and conceptual vastness. Um, so. Yeah, I think it is that. Yeah. Yep. And okay. so one of them, the meditative is more conceptual, mm -hmm. you know, and, but the, the perceptual is the contemplative part. So you actually are just beholding and you're kind of enwrapped by it. So, and I think the greater someone's soul, the smaller the things that they can find awe in. 
that if the more that the soul is kind of gross or untrained in it, like even the most re remarkable, striking things, you know, or the deepest mysteries of human life, you know, uh, wouldn't necessarily strike them. <laughs> so, but with practice, yeah, exactly. But with practice, I think, you know, you can develop this capacity to, to really, but it's, again, it's like learning how to appreciate ultimately more and more sublime mysteries, you know, and then to see them in permeating the more daily realities. Yeah. And it seems like there are all these positive benefits to reacting with, uh, reacting with awe. I'm sure there are like health benefits and psychological benefits, yeah. but I don't know. It seems to me the deep, deeper reason is because it's, it's just the proper reaction to have to things, to these kind of bigger realities or truths yes. that are just bigger than it's like, well, what else? It's just how you should act. In, <laughs> in some sense. Yeah. It's owed to these, you know, yeah. these things. And so, you know, if, you know, if you think about like the deepest truths in your life, you know, the, the deepest mysteries and truths, well, why not consider them many times a day? Yeah. You know, why not bring that into a practice of a golden hour that, that you let yourself have a moment of awe in, in the face of these, you know, and maybe it is conceptual. You're kind of thinking about it and maybe it is more perceptual. You're actually, you can kind of come to experience it in those moments, you know, and to, to savor it in those things until you get to a point of feeling that the, the awe is there. Um, research would show that your levels of interleukin-6 are just going to plummet. <laughs> it's one of these inflammatory modulators. That was the first thing I learned about awe some time ago. You know, it was a study that was about uh, this particular marker. Uh, and that uh, awe is one like specially powerful way of doing it. They measured all these different emotions but it was an awe that really correlated with decreasing immediately levels of interleukin-6. Uh, well, if you weren't sold on awe yet, now you should be, I think. Exactly. <laughs> Great. Well, Kevin, this has been fantastic. Um, I'm, yeah, super happy we had this discussion. So, But now, at this point, we're out of time. So I don't know if you have any final, final thoughts you want to leave us with. No, only that this kind of stuff gets better with practice. And the soul opens up to it more and more with practice. And it can actually be practiced very frequently. <clears throat> so I just encourage you know, our listeners to think of the people in their lives and the qualities that they would want to be more in awe of you know, and the, the, the deeper truths that they would like to carry with them. You know, and awe is how you actually put those things really deep into the depth of your soul. Awesome. Okay, great, Kevin. Thanks so much. Thanks, right. Take care. We'll be back next week. <laughs>